If you've been in the autism world for a while and you haven't heard of Kate Swenson from Finding Cooper's Voice, not sure where you have been. Kate just wrote a new book called Forever Boy. And from what I've heard about it so far, it is amazing. I haven't quite gotten to read it yet, but I will soon. It just came out today, April 5th, 2022. And um, I'm having an interview with her and I'm going to share an excerpt about the book right now. Welcome back to another video. I'm Dr. Mary Barbera, autism mom, behavior analyst, and best-selling author. Each week, I provide you with some of my ideas about turning things around for you, your child, or your clients. And so if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do that now. Today, I am sharing an excerpt from podcast number 170 with Kate Swenson and uh, talking about her new book, Forever Boy. I will read a little bit. One thing I wanted to say is, or two things. I've been asked if this is a book, if it's sad and they're gonna cry the whole entire time. No, it's honestly a really hopeful book. You're gonna have tears. I, I, I think you'll probably have some, but it's really hopeful. And the second thing is that I've been asked is, is this only for parents of children with autism? No, I have a big following of parents who's, um, or anybody whose life just didn't turn out as they expected. Maybe something just took a turn. So please know it's really a story like that too, where it's just really about plan B and how important that is. So I'm going to read from chapter eight and I'm going to read about when I first heard about autism. When the professionals first told me about autism, they described it to me as a spectrum. I immediately thought of a spectrum of light, like a rainbow through a prism, but it wasn't that kind of spectrum or at least the experts didn't explain it that way. They described it as a long line with one end being the most se severely affected and the other end being less affected. They threw terms at me like high functioning, low functioning, severe, moderate, and mild, even levels one, two, and three. When Cooper was diagnosed, I told myself he was on the right side of that spectrum, that he was high functioning and that we had won the autism lottery. I convinced myself that when his diagnosis was handed out, we got the good kind. I held on to that term, that safety blanket, so tightly as if it would protect us. After I learned to say the words, my son has autism out loud, and that took me a long time to be able to do, I started saying, my son has autism, but he's very high functioning. Our hearts eat lies when we are hungry, and I was ravenous. I soon learned, like most parents do, that Cooper's autism was being ranked on that spectrum. And before I knew it, instead of being Cooper, the little boy with blonde hair who loved trains and smelled like the wind, he was a number, a listing of ASD on a file folder. He was data and check boxes and eventually a graph that would put him on the most severe end of that spectrum until my sunshine boy became a black and white list of diagnoses in my desk drawer, void of his light. When I pictured that spectrum, the one they described to me, I imagined a long line drawn with a thick black Sharpie across a white wall down an endless bright hallway. It was straight as an arrow, no bumps, no hills, no crevices. It felt clinical. It felt like I was standing alone in that hallway with the white walls and white floors, watching Cooper toe the line, moving from right to left and farther away from me and everyone else. It almost felt like we were doing autism wrong, moving in the wrong direction, bucking the traditional path and dripping bits of color everywhere. Um, and that's not something you'll hear a lot about now is, that's, is the spectrum. And there's a lot of anger around the spectrum and what it is and that's how it was described to me in the beginning it was this this, this line this stark line and it's like you know yeah this is where you want to be and this is where you are and, and i don't think it's like that i think it's different yeah but not in the beginning it, it, that was beautiful i got chills okay. um and it it is really i mean and lucas was diagnosed in 1999 so there wasn't levels Okay. There was more confusion because it was PDDNOS. He got that oh, yeah. diagnosis. He got a diagnosis of PDDNOS with, and he also got the diagnosis at three of intellectual disability. So young. At the same time. And he was going to typical preschool without support. Oh. So he did look really mild. Yeah. My husband and I both thought it was going to be mild autism, but I was in a year in a year plus in denial. 
So it turned out to be moderate to severe autism. Then a month later, somebody else diagnosed him with PDD-NOS. Okay. And it was like, well, what is it? And when I asked, I had the developmental pediatrician and the psychologist from Children's Hospital in Philadelphia in the room, this one, the developmental pediatrician, Dr. James Copeland, and he was on the podcast so we can link that in the show notes. He gave him moderate to severe autism. The psychologist gave him PDD-NOS a, a month later. And I said, well, which is it? Yeah. And he said, what you want to know is what he's going to be like at eight. Yes. And, and 18 and neither one of us can tell you. And he's like, yes. it's like saying something is dark pink or light red. It depends on the day. It depends on the examiner. Yes. It depends on the testing they did. So, um, you know, it was, it was super confusing, but you know, what I've learned over the years, like I did a video blog on, can you tell how a two-year-old's going to do at eight or 18? And we can link that in the show notes. And the answer is no, you no. cannot tell, even if it looks like super mild, it could, you know, Lucas looked more, you know, when you said about high functioning, I've done the video blogs and podcasts on high functioning versus low functioning, which is now taboo. I mean, in 1999 and 2000, 2004, really before Facebook and Twitter and everything, um, there was no taboo around, well, really in 2013, when the DSM-4 went to five and Asperger's was cut out and mm -hmm. the NOS was cut out and, and everybody was merged together. I think it got um, more controversial and things like that. But within each child are their strengths and needs. And yep. so I say somewhere, a lot of places, that if you're a teacher and you you have eight kids in your class and you were asked to line them up in terms of who's highest functioning and who's lowest functioning, you would have a really tough time because are yeah. we talking about communication? We're talking about problem behaviors, we're talking about reading, math, taking them to a restaurant, um, how independent they are with toileting and showering and those sorts of things. Like within each child are their strengths and needs. And so it really is not helpful to compare kids to say he's high function. It's like splitting a room in half and saying, okay, this part is, this half of the room is stupid and this half of the room is smart. Mm -hmm. I am very not smart in some areas. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and so everybody, you know, all of your kids, my, my other child, you know, you have your strengths and needs, mm -hmm. you know, with or without disabilities of any sort. Mm -hmm. So um, love everything you said there. I think you, you know, I know our, our listeners are like appreciating your, your writing and like every excerpt I've heard is just more amazing than the first. I hope you enjoyed that short excerpt. If you did love it, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it with somebody else who may benefit. And for more information about how you might be able to join my online course and community, I would suggest you join a free workshop at marybarbera.com forward slash workshop. And I'll see you right here next week.